Johnson. All right. Good morning, everybody. Monday after Mother's Day. How was your Mother's Day? I hope everything was a blessing. Hope everything went well. Whether that was good memories of your mom or sitting around talking about your mom or to your mom. Uh, I hope you all had a great time. As we're diving in today, uh, we're talking about, let me just recap some things that we've covered already, right? So on our Money Hope Moments, we talk about ministry moments, how you can be a minister, how you're ministering to other people. Uh, we talk about prayer walking, right, with physical distance, six foot apart, prayer walking, Bible study, building your testimony, being obedient in Christ, and also, uh, last week we talked about confession of your sin. All markers of what talks about a growing believer in Christ. Someone getting closer and closer to Jesus on a regular basis. So today, what I want to talk to us about briefly is disciple making. And I know a lot of times when we talk about disciple making, people either have a panic attack or people are like, I'm already doing that. That's just natural. That, that's just the overflow of what we do or that's what we go to church for. But disciple making, what is a disciple? Disciple, in my opinion, is just someone that's getting closer and closer to Jesus. I like how Tim worded it yesterday in the sermon. Just when Jesus had these moments with people, a lot of times it was they would take up their faith stick and they would move it closer, right? And that's what we're talking about when we talk about being a disciple of Christ, is you get closer and closer to the image of Christ. So when we talk about disciple making, though, that's an intentional act. A disciple... When you become a believer, you become a disciple of Christ. In our vernacular, in who we are as the American church, I believe, uh, over the past several years, we've disassociated ourselves from I'm a believer in Christ to I'm a disciple of Christ. And I think a lot of times we like to separate those out almost as a second phase of salvation. But when you look at biblical times and you talk about being a believer of Christ, we're talking about being a disciple of Christ. And, and so here, what are we talking about disciple making? Mark chapter 1 verse 17. When Jesus calls the disciples to come forward, he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And uh, when you talk about Mark, that's probably just really the stories of Peter that Mark wrote down for Peter. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus says from the get-go, I don't need you to, to be someone that knows how to fish. I need you as someone that can teach someone else how to fish. I need you to be someone else that can teach other people. As I'm going to invest in you, I need you to be able to invest in other people. And uh, <clears throat> so the question is, who are you investing in? Who are you investing in in your walk with Christ during this time, during this phase of your life? Who are you investing with uh, about who Jesus is, but about who you are? And showing those attributes that God has changed in your life that you can say, hey, this is how God can change you as well. So, disciple-making, who are you investing in? Uh, Steve Horn, our executive director of the Louisiana Baptist Convention, was talking last week on, on a web, webinar, and he says, you know, parents, if you're not discipling your kids at home during this time, then it's probably going to be difficult for you to really ever do it unless you to train yourself to do that. Because you've been at home with your kids for two months, and the question is, you've been home two months for your kids. What have you done to invest in your kids' spiritual walk? And uh, I look even over my own, but also just thinking about all of our kids and our children's ministry, our youth ministry, my house included. What could we have done better to disciple our kids? Or do we just trust that bringing them to church is going to be good enough? And I think if we go with that mentality of let's just bring them to church, let someone else disciple them, let someone else do Bible study with them, everything's going to be okay. But if that were the case, then I believe the church in America would be doing a lot better too. The Bible doesn't say bring them to church and they'll be disciples of Christ. It says, you be a fisher of men. You invest in them. And uh, it falls either on parents, but it also falls on the body of Christ to be making disciples that go out outside the walls of the church. So you can be a disciple maker. And uh, so what are we talking about when we talk about being a disciple maker? <clears throat> We're talking about bringing people closer to Christ. So, and all these things that we've done, whether it's prayer walking, I've told you, make a list of your neighborhood of people you can talk to or pray for, pray over, right? Uh, we talked about how are you in the Word. We talked about you working on your testimony so you can share that testimony with people in your neighborhood, your coworkers, people in the other cubicle next to you. Be a disciple maker. You're bringing people closer to Christ, which means we have to be talking about Christ on a regular basis. 
which means we have to, and I'm not talking about just gospel presentation after gospel presentation. Maybe it's just a story. As we talked about when we did our Bible story study, maybe it's just a story that you tell people. So, you know what? I learned this about the Bible yesterday. Can I just bounce it off you, get your opinion of it, and I'll kind of tell you what we were talking about? Hey, this weekend I was at church. This is what I studied about. Hey, yesterday I had a quiet time open my Bible. This kind of stuck out to me. And if you just do that on a regular basis and it makes it more natural, one, for you to speak about it, but then people will start expecting you to talk about stories like that. And people start expecting to say, you know, hey, I have a question about God. Maybe they come to you at that point. But who are you investing in? You know, who are you bringing closer to Christ? I want us to understand that when we talk about disciple making, we're not talking about a checklist of things to do. Just because you've sat in a pew for a long time doesn't make you a mature believer in Christ. Just because you've been a believer since you were seven from a camp or from a vacation Bible school doesn't mean that now that you're 30, 40 plus that you're automatically mature in Christ. It's those daily things that we're doing to make us more and more mature in Christ. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 5, uh, end of chapter 5, beginning of verse 6, I was listening to that on my way into work today and talk, the writer of Hebrew was like, hey, it's time for you to move on from spiritual milk. Get some solid food. Grow up. And all you, you know, grow up and start nourishing on real food instead of still discussing the traditions that you used to follow and the traditions that you follow in the Jew Jewish culture, but now you're a believer and you're like, what can we do, what can we not do, versus just grow up and start eating some of the, the real food, not just the spiritual milk. Move past your original calling to be a follower of Christ. Move past it. And I think... A lot of times that's what we do is we think that we can do some of these great attributes. We can confess our sins. We can, we can be obedient to Christ. We can be in Bible study and in prayer on a regular basis. But if we're not building others up in that, then we've missed a whole other next level of what a disciple is and what a believer in Christ is. Because I think when we're called to be obedient, then we're called to be just like his original 12 were. Follow me and you'll become fishers of men. He walks into Nathaniel and says, follow me. He walks up to Matthew, the tax collector, and says, follow me. He walks up to numerous people in the New Testament and says, follow me. And many people gave a lot of excuses for why they couldn't follow him. And a lot of times, many people just realized the cost wasn't great enough. Jesus' message to people were, follow me, follow me, follow me. And so as we're going through this, I want you to understand it's not about, hey, did you have your quiet time today? Because yes, that's good. And if you can have quiet times five out of seven days a week, check, you're more mature. Odds are you probably will be, right? But that doesn't automatically mean you're going to be more mature just because you've got a great habit along the way. But are you being obedient to what the Bible says? If you're not being obedient to it, then reading it, probably not going to help as much, right? Are you praying and lifting up people? If you're praying the wrong way and praying selfishly, then prayers aren't going to be getting answered as often or as much. But when we're being obedient to what God has called us to do, and we're thinking of others as Christ has taught us to do, then we're praying for other people's needs. Then we're praying for us to grow so we can help other people. So just having a checklist doesn't automatically equal spiritual maturity. So what are we looking for? So I want you to understand it's not a checklist we do, but it's a journey that we're on. Okay? Is our journey getting us closer and closer toward Jesus? And I understand it's not necessarily a straight path, right? There's going to be ups and downs in our journey. There's going to be mountains. There's going to be valleys. But it's not just a checklist of boxes and all of a sudden we equal maturity. Again, it's not a formula that we do. It's life that we live. It's life that we experience. So look at it from, I'm going on a journey. One, so I can be a better disciple. But two, so I can be a disciple maker as we move forward. So a couple quick questions we just want to answer. And these are basic English questions, right? When you write when you write about a topic, this is what I was taught, you write who, what, when, where, how, why, and to what extent. Now you think that's going to be a long hope moment here just because of all those questions, but I'm going to hit them real briefly, okay? Who do you disciple? Who do you disciple? Well, look in your life. First off, it's obvious it should be your family. That's a given. Uh, the Bible says that very clearly. Parents, you're in charge of your kids, but I would also say parents, adults, Believers, you're in charge of originally reaching out to your family members. The Philippian jailer, whenever uh, uh, Paul, the, the prison was open, what he do? He took him home to his house 
And him and his house became believers of Christ. And I think that's what we got to understand. It's to our family first. But I also want us to look beyond that as well. And uh, when I first came, we talked about how do we uh, uh, inter intermingle our church body, our believers in Christ. And I said, look, if we would just sit back and think of, because one, your family's given. You're going to take care of your parents. You're going to take care of your kids. You're going to take care of, of friends that you know. Is there someone in your life, one generation above you, that you can just minister to, that you can invest in or you can learn from? You can pick their brain with their wisdom. Find out who that person is outside of your family because your family's expecting you. Jesus even said even the Gentiles love their own, right? Go find that one person, a generation above, that you can glean some information off of, that you can be sharpened by. Look for someone, one generation below, that you can invest in, that you can say, hey, I just want to journey along this path with you for a while. I want to help you grow in Christ, but I also, it's going to help you grow in Christ as well. But then also look, someone within your own age group that you can uh, sharpen each other with, right? Accountability partner, uh, someone that you can just cast your burdens upon and they can cast your burdens on as well. And that's going to help you grow as well. But then also someone over here that's lost. Someone that doesn't know Christ that you're just going to pray for and you're going to invest in until they come to know Christ, right? So you got someone a generation above, generation below, someone within your own generation that's, that's a believer that's going to help both of y'all out. And then someone that's probably within your generation that God's called you to just to do evangelism with. I think if we talk about those four types of people, uh, we're talking about being a disciple maker, that we're going to see dramatic difference in people's lives. So who needs to be a who do we need to disciple? There's your, there's, there's your who. What? What do we need to do as a disciple maker? We need to bring people closer to Jesus. And I think when we talk about disciple making, we're talking about bringing people that are lost along their journey until they come to know Christ. But then that's not the finish line. That's not the end point. That's the beginning point. You've already invested with them up to here. And a lot of times, oh, you got saved, great, go get in a Bible study. Which is good, but that's not their habit. Their habit's talking to you. So you get them to this point, they accept Christ, and it's your turn to grow them from that point forward. Hey, you need to be a part of a small group Bible study, but let me also walk alongside of you to show you how to read the Bible. Let me show you how you need to pray. Let me show you what obedience in Christ means. And that's where we're walking along. So what do we do? We're bringing people closer to Christ, not to salvation and abandoning them. Bring them to Christ and then more and more in the image of Christ beyond. So thirdly, when? Hey, these are simple questions. When do you disciple somebody? Whenever you want, all the time, you're choosing. Uh, when, weekly, bi-weekly, daily, a text message, now we know how to Zoom, now we know how to do Facebook Live, for those that haven't. I mean, you can have conference calls on a daily basis. You can call someone all the time. You can set up a meeting face-to-face. -face. Uh, you can FaceTime people. Where are we going to do this? Same thing, you're choosing. Coffee shop, you know. Um, conferences, text messages. Some people just do discipleship based off text messages. They have a list of questions they answer every day, and that's how they, they uh, do some accountability. But I also want you to look at it this way. Maybe even if it's someone here in the church that you're growing, we have several services, and when things kind of go back to when Bible study times happen, you can come to church, go to Bible study, and stay one extra hour and disciple somebody one-on-one, -on -one, right? You're already here. Take a little extra time out of your day and just have those times where you say, you know, we're just going to hang out for an extra hour. There's another church service going and we're just going to meet and uh, have a cup of coffee and we're going to discuss uh, how your week's going. That's a great opportunity for us to do that one-on-one -on -one discipling along the way. So who, what, when, where, how. Once again, it's not a checklist, but uh, it's, it's what the person needs. How do we disciple somebody? Well, when you get to know somebody, you're going to know what their needs are. You're going to know what their struggles are. You're going to know what their, uh, uh, their struggles are, their strengths, their weaknesses are. And that's how you disciple, just to help them out in their weaknesses. Because a lot of times I notice I, I get kind of drawn to people that are my weaknesses. Like, I can do this very well. I don't do this so much, but the people I hang out with, they do this very well. I guess because I just, hey, you, got, you can help me out my weakness, you know. So you can sharpen one another to help grow each other as you go. So how do you do it? It's not a checklist. It's not a, hey, do this, do this, don't do this, boom, boom, boom. It's a, how's your life going? How's your week going? How have you been in the Word? 
What do you need to know about the word? How can you share that word with someone else? Just not a checklist, keep walking through. Why do we do disciple making? And I think this is one of the things that we know in our head, we don't live in our heart. Why do we need to do disciple making? Because it's a mandate by God. It's a mandate by Jesus. When he left, Matthew 28, uh, verse 19 through 20, known as the Great Commission, he could have said a lot of things, but what did he say? Go make disciples. Make disciples is the key verb in all that. It's a command. Go make disciples. As you're going, make disciples. His intent was Peter, Peter, James, John, I'm leaving. Now, who's going to follow you? Who are you going to go invest in and follow with? We see this in Paul's life all through Acts. Is people are always going with Paul. Paul never does a missionary journey by himself. He's bringing people with him. And we find people like Titus and Timothy. You know, uh, we find other people along the ways we're going. You got Barnabas and Silas. Barnabas was actually mentoring Paul. But you got Silas. All these people that you see are journeying. And one of my favorite parts of Acts, there's a couple of sections there, is when all of a sudden Luke joins the scene. It goes from the, and they travel to, and we traveled. Because Luke became a part of the journey that Paul was on. So, so when you talk about disciple, why do we do it? It's because that's what Christ has called us to do. It started with him. It went to 12 disciples. Those 12 disciples then discipled other people. And they sent it out beyond that. And we can't let that die with our generation. We can't let that die within our culture. It's our job. That's why we do it. Now, here's a question that I'm always interested in. And I think it's a question we always kind of leave out. And that question is, disciple-making to what extent do we do this? And one of the last questions we always ask on the who, what, when, where, why, how, we always leave out to what extent. And I think a lot of times that's where we need to focus. To what extent do we need to be disciple makers? And uh, I would ask the question, to what extent did Jesus make disciples? For three years he invested wholeheartedly in the people. He poured everything he had into a group of 12, into a group of 40, a group of 72, and a group of even 400 people that followed him. He poured into those people, not to mention all the people that would tug on his cloak or all those people that would come and talk to him uh, outside of that group. He invested everything he had to make disciples to carry on the mission, right? So, to what extent? Easy. Just as the sermon was yesterday, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. And if God would not even hold back his own son for our salvation, for us to be believers, why would we hold anything else back as well? So to what extent will God push us, grow us, to be disciple makers? Three big things in our life that I think that we can see where we needed to have some moments that pushed us outside of our walls. First one, first one for me was Katrina. Uh, when you don't meet for church for a long time because of catastrophe and you're just going to meet people's needs, we saw that God pushed us out of our church to do ministry. I know around here, the, the 2016 flood, right? God pushed you, washed you out of your house, some people's homes, to go do ministry out in people's homes. And now here we are, 2020, a pandemic where everything's shut down and we aren't allowed to meet. We can't get close to people. We should be having this hunger in our life of not just wanting to be around people, but want to be around people to make a forever difference in their life. We want to be around people to say, hey, when we get let loose of this, we're not going back the same way. Why? Because we need to go out and be more intentional in what we do. We need to go out and make disciples. We need to go out and make sure that our community knows about Jesus. Because just because they open doors up and say, hey, you can go meet and go hang out and go out to eat, doesn't mean that people's lives automatically go back to normal. There's going to be the fallout, whether it's an emotional fallout, a financial fallout, a mental fallout of everything that's taken place in these past two months. And that's where we as a church need to understand it could happen to some people within inside of these walls, but it's also going to happen to people outside of our walls. You know, the people within inside our walls, we have Sunday school, we have people that should be contacting you to help in that support, but there's people out there that have no one. That's why we do prayer walking is because... We're going to see those needs of people in our community where they have sat here and they said, we have no hope. 
We have no hope. We do not know what to do. But yet those that have hope in their life of Christ, when we pray for them, when we study the word and share the word with them, when we give our testimony, when we're being obedient, when we're confessing our sins to one another, and then we are intentionally reaching out to people to grow them closer to Christ, Man, now we got some good influence going on. Now we got momentum building. Now we got people in our community being hungry for the Word of God to want to grow and be impactful in our community. So, what is disciple making? It's everything we've been talking about prayer walking, Bible study, testimony, being obedient, right? Confessing our sins, but also being intentional to go out and build those relationships. So, with that being said, that's what I got for today. I hope, I hope you can pray about it. Just sit back and think of, God, who are you, what names are you putting in my life that I need to invest in? One generation above, one below, one that's lost, and one that can be an accountability partner. Who are those relationships I have in my life? Maybe they're not formal. Maybe you need to formalize them a little bit. Maybe it's just I need to be more intentional with it. God's put those names on your list. Connect with them today, right? Connect with them today. Call them, text them. And just say, hey, I think we need to start getting together on a regular basis. Hey, I would like to learn from you on a regular basis. Hey, I would like to invest in you to help make sure how your spiritual walk's growing uh, and be intentional about that along the way, all right? Well, thank you all for being here with me. I hope you have a great week. I hope, uh, I know Governor's making an announcement today at 2.30 uh, about the um, uh, stay-at-home order. Not sure how that's going to go, but uh, be listening at 2.30. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're doing a uh, family chat. Uh, Willow Park family, uh, I call it a fireside chat, right? But we're going to be doing a Facebook Live here at the church, and you're going to be able to answer questions and answers about new protocols and stuff for when the doors are open and our services and how we're going to handle things. We're going to give you what we have, and you may have some questions, and you can be around someone monitoring to help ask questions back to us, okay? You can always reach out and contact us in the office as well uh, or on our cell phones or our emails, okay? But good seeing y'all. I hope you all have a great week, and God bless.